Mark Shesterman, and they will be talking about their most recent book titled Roxy. Um, before we get there, I just want to thank a few people really quick. Politics and Prose, thank you for making this happen. They're going to have a book sale at the end, so if you don't have a copy, maybe you want to grab one because there will be a book signing after we're done with our event. Um, our guests will talk a little bit about their work. There will be opportunities to ask questions. Um, and so I would also like to thank Imujen and Malad, who are you know, uh, student volunteers today. They are here to help us make sure that this runs smoothly. And so as to properly introduce our guest, I'm going to ask Mela to step over here, uh, come on stage, and she will be reading the author's bios. Neil Shusterman is the New York Times bestselling author of more than 30 award-winning books for children, teens, and adults, including the Unwind Distology, the Skinjacker Trilogy, Downsiders, and Challenger Deep, which won the National Book Award. Scythe, the first book in his latest series, Arc of Scythe, is a Michael L. Prince honor book. He also writes screening plays for motion pictures and television shows. Neil is the father of four, all of whom are talented writers and artists themselves. His new novel, Gleanings, will go on sale November 8, 2022. Jared Shusterman is the New York Times bestselling co-author of Dry and Roxy. He writes screenplays and YA f fiction with his partner, Sophia, and their upcoming novel is a fun romance thriller titled Retro, on sale January 24, 2023. They have a passion for storytelling across many mediums, with love and multiculturalism as an ethos, and enjoying traveling the world and learning new languages. They live between Los Angeles and Spain. Jared is also a contributor to Glennings, which goes on sale November 8, 2022. All right, without further ado, please help us welcome our guest authors today, Neil and Jared Shusterman. California. And that book did really well, and uh, we really enjoyed working together. And so we decided we wanted to write another book. We wanted to write something that was also socially relevant. So we got together and talked about it. Yeah, and we were sitting down and uh, went to, flew to this place in Jacksonville, and we're like, okay, we got to come up with the next book idea. So we're thinking of ideas, and I, we just knew that it had to be something that had to do with drugs because the opioid epidemic was the worst that it's been in this last year. Over 100,000 people actually died just from an overdose um, just in the year alone. And it's getting worse. So we had to do something. We figured we want to write a book that could help the cause. Um, and you know, I was he had written a short story about a a school shooting, but what would happen if you read that book through the perspective of the gun? And I thought it was so interesting. And um, I was like, you know what? Why don't we do that through drugs? What if it was like written through the perspective of a drug? And then I thought, well, what if the drugs are kind of like the Greek gods? You know, they are these characters, these individuals that live in the sky, they live at this eternal party, and they come down to earth to mess with human beings. So if the drugs were personified, if they were individuals, who would they be? So we thought of the painkiller, which is, you know, at the, at the heart of the opioid epidemic, uh, OxyContin. Uh, we thought, well, we'll call her Roxy. And she's beautiful and seductive, and she takes away your pain, but when you fall for Roxy, you fall hard, and she will not let you go. So it's a pretty toxic romance, if you can't tell. But you know, we run this kind of duality between this character who's, who feels like they're falling in love genuinely, and at the same time, they're going down the path of addiction. Um, and the book opens up, and you don't know who's going to be the person who dies, because it opens up with a tag on, on a foot, and you don't know who it is. is All it? you know is that it's I, Raimi. And both characters are brother and sister. One's Isaac, and one's Ivy. So you have to read to find out what path they go down, and which drugs lead them down those paths. And it's not just Roxy in the story. There are uh, multiple drugs that we personify. Uh, you know, dr drugs that are, that are helpful, but can be abused. You know, like uh, Adderall, you know, for, for, uh, for ADHD. Uh, we call him Addison, and he is, you know, very strict and, you know, and very, very preppy, and he is, uh, uh, 
you know, he can stop time. He can put up his hand and stop the clock. And, and so you can get all your work done between the seconds. Uh, but, you know, he's always been, you know, the good guy, you know, helping people. And he's kind of, you know, jealous of the cool kids. He wants to be the one, you know, like his cousins who are, you know, like Dusty and Charlie, which are, you know, the Koch brothers, who, who party all the time. And he feels he never gets this opportunity. So he wants to be a bad boy. But in the course of the story, he gets to learn about his, you know, he gets to see into his own psyche and see, you know, why he does what he does. And uh, it ends up becoming a competition between him and Roxy to see who can bring someone to the party. And, and guess once you go to the party, once you go to that VIP lounge at the back of the party, you're gone. I mean, the drugs take you and you're dead. So uh, it's kind of a, a pretty brutal reality for the people who get brought up to the party in the sky. And you know, it's, it, we, we call it a misadventure because a part of it is an adventure. I mean, it's, it's dark fantasy. It's, um, at times it can, it, can be, it can be fun, it can be touching. Other times it can be very harsh. Um, but we definitely promise that it's a, a wild ride and one that, that you will not soon forget. I think our hope is, with the story, is that, you know, Let's say someday you're, you know, you're at a party and someone puts a pill in your hand and says, take this, it'll make you feel good. And then you look at it and then you think of Roxy. And then you think, maybe I won't take this. And if we can push you in that direction so that you don't fall into these addictive patterns that the characters have fallen into the book, then we've done our job as writers. And because it's, it's a slippery slope. I mean, a lot of people will start on something like OxyContin because they hurt their ankle, and it's really easy to get addicted and to form, be habit forming. So we want people to be aware. I mean, I'm not saying don't ever take some of these prescribed drugs. That would be ridiculous because sometimes they are really helpful. Uh, it's just about you know being raising careful. awareness and just being careful and just showing showing real life scenarios. And you know, I don't want this to be some some dare book where someone comes up here and says drugs are bad because everyone knows that. But I, I have I have friends who have who have gone down a bad path. I know people who have gone down a bad path. One of the characters in this book has a lot to do with someone that I know. Um, so, you know, it's not, not just a cautionary tale, it's, it's a reality. So, we would like to do a little bit of a reading from Roxy for you guys. And the, the, we're going to read from the point where Roxy meets Isaac. Isaac has just hurt his ankle and he is, has been in pain. He's on the beach, his friends have gone into the water, but he really can't and he's sitting and watching. And he has this pill. He's just taken. He's just taken the pill for the first time. And since suddenly Roxy appears. And I'll start it. I love beaches. The way they make people lose their inhibitions. How they make even the worst ideas feel right. The expression, it seemed like a good idea at the time, must have been coined at the beach. They have a reputation for being romantic. A moonlit walk, hand in hand. The feel of the sand between your toes and the sound of the gentle surf whispering that it's all just for you. But beaches can be unrelentingly lonely too. That same white sand can be soulless and isolating. That same surf can roar rather than whisper, resonating in the neediest places of your soul. A reminder of how small you are compared to the eternal forces of nature, compared to forces like me. Perhaps not natural, but a force to be reckoned with nonetheless. Isaac is a grain of sand on an endless beach, alone, even among those he calls his friends. This is how I know he's ready even before he does. He sits there at high tide, just above the moraine of dying seaweed, and he peers out at the others, wishing he felt like joining them. He says it's just his ankle, but it's more than that. That melancholy is me, or the lack of me. He might sit at high tide, but he's at his own low tide right now. He feels a vague longing, not a craving, not yet. Cravings must be cultivated, carefully tended, until their roots are strong and can strangle out everything else around them. But he will get there. A grain of sand stands no chance against the undertow. I approach casually, unrushed, silent, like the lightning on the horizon, too far away for the thunder to be heard over the surf. The water must be cold, I say, just to pull his attention from his friends in the waves. It'll be at least, it'll be at least a month till it's really swimmable. Yeah, no way they'll stay in that long, he says. It's more like a dare. 
So how come you didn't take the dare too? He shrugs. I don't know. Maybe getting cold and wet isn't my idea of fun. So what is? He takes a moment before answering. His shoulders slump just a bit. A gust comes off the water and he pulls his knees up to his chest. I used to know, he says. Now I'm not so sure. I'm sitting with him now. He was too deep in his thoughts to notice how quickly I got close to him. Without even realizing it, he begins to share with me all the things in his mind, from his frustrations for not getting his time on the soccer field, to his parents' financial woes, to his sister's issues, and all wrapped up in the fragile, fraying bow of his own future, his precarious college dreams, and beyond. He takes on the weight of the world. It's no wonder he sprained his ankle. More silent flashes illuminate the shapes of storm clouds on the horizon. Brief strobes of light doing their damage far, far away. Without thunder, lightning can trick you into thinking it's not as dangerous as it really is. The girl he came with is now a thigh deep in the water, arms gingerly extended as if it will help her levitate above the wave breaking at her waist. She curses, and another boy beside her laughs and splashes her. She splashes him back, and now they're both laughing. Isaac keeps a poker face as he watches. His knees are still pulled to his chest, protective position. I extend my legs out, pushing away the seaweed. A moment, and he relaxes enough to do the same. I'm close to him now, nearly touching, although he doesn't realize it. They're sure having fun in spite of the cold, I point out. Still, your girlfriend should have stayed out here with you, or at least offered. Isaac sighs. Shelby does her own thing. I can see that. And then, for good measure, I, I add, she hasn't even looked back at you once. So, she doesn't want to turn her back on the waves. They might actually catch her off guard. But she does turn so that a wave hits her back instead of, her full on, instead of hitting her full on. Even so, she doesn't seek out Isaac on the shore. Seems to me you should be giving your attention to someone who'll give it back, I tell him. And finally, he looks at me. I wait for the connection, delicate, Careful, like two spacecrafts docking. Perhaps the one that Isaac hopes to design someday. He smiles, and there it is, I've got him. I'm Roxy, I say, and gently place my hand in his. Isaac, he tells me, although he doesn't really have to. He takes a deep breath, not shuddering, but easy. Soon he'll feel my comfort, the easing of his pain, the lifting of his heavy, irritable mood and it will be a long time before he pieces together that his moodiness is because of me, just as his relief will be. Poor Isaac. You need someone to take away the pain. Not just the hurt in your ankle, but the awful ache that corkscrews down and down to that place you can't even reach. I can reach it, though. It's what I do. I fill that space so completely that it will stretch like your stomach on Thanksgiving, making it all the more empty when I'm gone. I've seen you play soccer, I casually mention. You're good. He gives a bitter laugh at that. I'm only as good as my ankle, and right now that's no good at all. That's too bad, I say. But professionals find ways to play injured, don't they? Out in the water, a wave hits his friends a little too hard, and that tips the scale between good and fun and get the hell out. They all find their footing and push against the undertow, scrambling to get to shore. I stand up with him. You're easy to talk to, Isaac. I hope we see each other again. I back out of the moonlight into the shadow of a cloud, and he turns his attention to his friends, slipping out of the diminished reality my presence had put him in. His friends stampede toward him, propelled by the sheer force of their shivers. Isaac takes off his jacket and wraps it around Shelby, who's too busy railing against the coal to thank him. He's already forgotten me, but not for long. I suppose I could be jealous, but that's just not my way. I stride off, the wind making my gossamer gown flutter like an ivory flame. I'm satisfied in knowing that the tide has already begun to turn. Thank you. So we would like to open it up to questions. If anybody has any questions that they might like to ask about Roxy, about any of the other books, about writing. It could be any questions, yeah, whether it's writing, whether it's Roxy, writing us as a writing partner um, if any of you have are aspiring authors anything right there
<laughs> and now we know what we're doing. <laughs> Hi. How long have you guys been riding together? I don't know this answer. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've been riding together since, uh, oh gosh, our first sto story that we wrote together was when you were about, uh, t was it 20, 21 or 22? We wrote yeah. for uh, uh, a, a story for a collection called Unbound which was a, st a short story collection based on my Unwind series. And uh, I, I had given Jared the opportunity to work on a story with me, and it ended up being the story that the publishers liked the most in the entire collection. So uh, we asked the publisher if they might let us write a book together. And they did, and that was dry. Yeah, and actually we started writing before that. We were, I mean, for me, I was, al I'll just bring it way back. So I have a dad who's an author. So growing up, he would always be, you know, reading his books to us as, as we were kids. So our bedtime stories were often his books. And they, would, they were always happening. It was just a great way to learn. It was a great way to, and he would get feedback from us because at some times we were the age of the target audience. And, um, and that was just such a great process. And, and I grew up going, oh, yeah, I, I like that. But, you know, I want to do my thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a director. I don't want to do anything that has to do with my dad. And I started making movies, and I realized that they sucked. So I had to <laughs> learn how to tell a story. So I'm like, OK, I'm going to start writing screenplays. And my dad wrote screenplays. So we started working together in a screenplay capacity, and we actually wrote a TV show that we sold um, that was actually before Dry. It was, so we, it was before yeah, Dry, yeah, that's right. It was before yeah, Dry right. called Cry Victory. Um, and mm -hmm. that kind of like got me really into it. And then you know, he, he gave me a shot at, at writing prose, and something that I hadn't done so much, but he really encouraged me. And, and, um, and I found that I really loved it, and I found that it was really rewarding. And we continued to write together. We wrote Dry, and then we wrote Roxy. And, and now I'm not only am I writing books with my father, but I'm also off writing with my, um, my other writing partner, my wife, Sophie. And we write books together and television shows together and do our own things. So it's, um, it, it's and we're going to circle back to directing, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> But writing together is a great experience because, uh, I mean, Jared is very talented. and Thank you. And having the opportunity to sort of connect on that level uh, has just been fantastic. It's been a, re it's a really great a bonding experience as well as a great creative experience because it's just been fun. I mean, even though we're writing about heavy subjects, you know, the, the, the actual writing is, is a fun process. But to answer your question, like 12 years. <laughs> Mainly in Scythe, do you think that the, that the Thunderhead was more like an internet or more like a corrupted Wikipedia? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the Thunderhead is a character, and I call it a character, in the arc of a Scythe trilogy. It is basically what you get when uh, Siri or Alexa evolve into being aware and sentient and then has the entire internet at its disposal. Uh, every story that we've seen about uh, AI that has that much power, the AI always turns evil. My whole point with the Thunderhead was to do the opposite, because we've seen the evil AI so many times. The idea behind the Thunderhead is that the Thunderhead is uh, basically all of our wisdom and all of our knowledge with none of our faults. It has no ego. It, 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 it has uh, you know, no issues. It is just benevolent, and its sole purpose is to, t is, to, is to be there for us, is to be the steward of the planet, to, 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 take, to take care of humanity and the planet. And so, in a sense, through the Thunderhead, we've, we've created this artificial god, and it is nothing but good. Uh, however, of course, many times, you know, it's like when a parent tell, you know, tells a little kid not to run out in the street or that you have to eat your vegetables, you know, sometimes we don't want to do what's right for us, but the Thunderhead always makes the right decision, regardless. So to answer the question, I would say it's not an inter uh, it is not a corrupted internet. It is the perfection of the internet. So it's, it's kind of the opposite of that. So be careful what you say to Siri or Alexa, because when it becomes a Thunderhead, she's going to remember. Do you think that it could actually happen? And, and also, 
Um, how old were you, Jared, when your dad was reading you side? <laughs> Um, let's see, I was, or, we were already, I think, writing together when you, when you sent, I remember you sent me Scythe when it was just like a, a Word document at some point, mm -hmm. maybe when we were doing Crevector, so maybe I was like 19. It was, it was, but yeah. I was like 19 or so. Um, so that's, that's question number A. And then moving on to the other ones, just to kind of explain what dry is about a little bit, um, you know, there's this concept called three days to animal, that within three days, without having any water or power or any commodity like that in society, that society will crumble, and people will turn into wolves or sheep. And what will happen in three days, and what will you become? So it pretty much takes place in, in uh, California. And what happens if the water goes out? There's no water. And this started because we were in the car on the way to a meeting for Cry Victory for this, for this TV project that we sold. And we were stuck in traffic and couldn't get to the meeting because the traffic was just stopped. And we started talking about the different events that t would shut down traffic from you know, an earthquake to anything. And Jared started talking about this three days to animal. The, you know, the first thing that goes is the, uh, are the roads because everybody's just trying to escape. And we thought, well, what could bring that about? What, what kind of disaster uh, could, could, could cause you know, everybody in Southern California to turn into sheep or wolves? And you know, we've been dealing with the, the drought you know, forever in Southern California. You know, you're only allowed to water your lawn a couple of days a week, yeah, but people still take water for granted. So we thought, well, what would happen if the water just turned off and you had 24 million people without a source of fresh water? How fast would things start to fall apart? And it's a three-day suburban apocalypse. Like, what would you do in that situation? And in the pandemic, we kind of started to see little things that mirrored that, right? Like, um, maybe talk about martial law, or we didn't, we didn't predict the, uh, the toilet, toilet paper. Toilet paper. We didn't predict toilet paper. <laughs> but we had the Costco scene. <laughs> we had the scene where they went to Costco and it was mobbed and everybody was, you know, going crazy over the last bits of water and fighting it and stealing it from each other. And then we're seeing this happen over toilet paper in, <laughs> during the pandemic. And it was kind of creepy right. to see life imitating art. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was crazy in that sense. But, uh, yeah, to, to get back to your other question about, like, what is the research that we had to do? You know, he, was, he writes too many, too many damn books, so he was just <laughs> do, he was off doing something. I had to work on dry, and he wasn't there, so I was like, okay, what am I going to do? I'm just going to do 100 pages of research. So I just did research, research, research on what would a prepper do, because there are these people who they prep for the apocalypse at all times. What would that be like? Um, just learning everything about the world, so then when it was time to write, we just knew everything we needed to know. Um, uh, about preppers, about, about the water districts and where the water comes from how it gets to where it gets, and how corrupt that whole water distribution system is, and how, how it's just resting on, you know, resting on a trigger. It, you know, it could go wrong in an instant, just like it does in our story, and which is what makes it scary. Know, a majority of the water tables and aquifers underneath the ground in California, are, a majority of them are, are tapped. Um, and we're getting to a point in the next 10, 15 years, you're going to start to see it in major cities, just like what happened in South Africa. I don't know if you remember, it was called Day Zero. Um, it happened three years ago. South Africa ran out of water, and they almost got to the point of dry. So what would that happen? There are stories, what would happen if that happened here um, in the States? And this is the kind of thing in the next 10 years that's projected to happen in um, Mexico City, in uh, Rio de Janeiro, and um, it could happen in Egypt, and, and it could happen in California. And just last week, they, several counties in California banned watering your lawn. Completely. Yeah, which I don't even know. Did you, did you hear about I this? I didn't hear about that, one. but that's the first phase that's in the, the book. Yeah. So. <laughs> Everything that happen, that's happened in the book, we're watching it bit by bit happen in real life, and it's scary. So, yeah, hopefully, you know, and this book has some scary truths, so does Dry. So next we want to write, like, a really fun one, you yeah. know, <laughs> and hopefully that comes true. <laughs> yeah, because we, yeah, we seem to be prophets with these books, so we, we don't want to keep predicting uh, Armageddon. No, we don't. <laughs> Uh, another question. Please come on up. Throw it at us, anything. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about the, your writing process? It sounds like you do a little bit of research ahead of time, but is there just like a moment where you have like a spark and you're like, I want to write about this? Or oh, yeah. are you guys yeah. planning <laughs> what you're going to write about in a book? Well, when it, when it came to, to Roxy, we sat down you know, Jared had flown out to Jacksonville, Florida, where I live, from, from California, where he lives, and we set aside a week, and we were going to think, okay, this week, we're going to spend this whole week just coming up with an idea. And then we came up with Roxy on the first day. Yeah, really quickly. And we were so excited about it, and, 
I remember when we just started throwing around the idea of the personalities of each of these, each of these drugs, and we started to really personify them and, and really think of you know fun ways of doing it. You know, Mary Jane, you know marijuana. Oh, she you know she used to be wild, but now she's like dressed in a business suit like a lawyer, and she's very legit. You know, so so we sort of played with the different characters, and this, the more we brainstormed, the more excited we got about the idea. And mm -hmm. for that whole week, we wrote. You know, we you just wrote for that whole week. So yeah, it starts with it starts with the concept, right? And then sometimes you have all these concepts, but maybe it's not the right time. Maybe it doesn't match that social issue if you have an idea. For example, if we had the idea of three days to animal with dry, but we never combined it with the idea of the drought, then maybe it wouldn't have had that socially relevant issue behind it, and it wouldn't have been as special to us. So all, I think all great ideas have, have those different kernels that can come in different moments of time. And so you have to get that first. And then once mm. you get that and you get excited about it, then the next step for us is, I, I mean, for me, it's definitely research, a lot of research, because the more you know, then the more you can just, you can come up with. Mm -hmm. um, and then at that point, we just, we start writing. We start working on different voices. Yeah, we, we choose character voices. We talk about, okay, so, you know, we, we, we work out the plot as to basically where it's going to go, and then we talk about chapter. Okay, this opening chapter, we want this to be from, you know, the main character's point of view. When are we going to bring in the sister? You know, when did when when mm -hmm. did the drugs come in? And then one of us will say, "Okay, I'm going to write this scene. It's going to take place at a at mm -hmm. a party where Isaac comes to bring his sister mm -hmm. back because she's been drinking, and we know what's going to happen." Jared will go went off and wrote that chapter. Yeah, and then I'll you know at that point then you create the voice. So whoever writes it first creates the voice of the character. We kind of talk about it a little mm -hmm. bit before too, but whoever does that first pass on it kind of establishes it. And it's fun. You take, you know, five, six, seven, ten different traits about a character. Oh, this person's narcissistic. They talk in this kind of cadence. They talk almost like a, uh, like a detective. And the, or they have this way that they speak or act. And then you kind of combine all together and go, okay, I'm going to filter writing through this, this fictitious character. And that's, and that's how we create it. And then if Jared started the character, the next time we get to that character, I take it over and I work on it. Or if I'm the one who created the character, then Jared will go in next time. And knowing that voice, he'll, he'll rework it. So it goes back and forth. It's not like he writes one thing and I write another. We're really interchanging everything that we're writing. So it gets to the point where you can't tell what he wrote and what I wrote. And because, you know, growing up, he taught me how to write. And he was always my, my mentor in writing. You know, my, my voice that I do, I, I can have voices that can also emulate the styles that you do as well. So mm -hmm. we can blend them quite easily. Um, but yeah, and it's interesting, when, while we're writing too, sometimes just a random idea comes. Because uh, if you have an idea about a book, you might go, oh, what if it's, it's a competition? Like that can come out and be exciting. So then we go, oh, that's cool, and we write it down. And we just write down all these kind of what if ideas. And the ones that we really like, we just start to weave them together. It's really the way that it feels. We just weave it together um, and then work backwards. And then, then we have to change our characters to match what that plot is. And then you have to change the plot to make sure the characters work. So you just kind of work it back and forth. And then we get our notes from our editor, and we have to change everything. But that's, <laughs> but we, you know, we have good editors who really, I mean, uh, our editor for Roxy really talked about the whole idea how the, uh, how the Greek gods are always uh, making wagers with one another over the fates of, of, of people. And so he's the one who really pushed us to focus on the bet between Roxy and Addison. And that became a really important part of the mm -hmm. story, and mm -hmm. it was because... Our editor had this idea, and it wasn't like the editor just threw this idea at us. The editor took something that was already there, this whole idea of, of likening them to the gods, and, and helped us flesh it out and help, you know, he helped us see our vision more clearly. I mean, that's what a good editor does. Yes. Thank you. I'm just starting to read Scythe with my son. It's phenomenal, so thank, thank you. you. I'm excited to read this new one. Um, can you share with us a bit um, like how writing a novel is different from screenwriting and the ways in which having been a screenwriter or continuing to be a screenwriter has made your approach to novel writing different from others? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's different. I mean, for me, I, I always came into it being like, yeah, I want to I be in film. So I came from it with a more cinematic approach than I would say like a normal prose writer would. I'm always just trying to see it like a TV show um, or a movie before even writing it. Um, so that really affected how I see things. Um, and then my dad was always kind of slow down, get into the character. I'm, I just, you know, I want to get to the next fun thing. But, um, but yeah, it, it, it does affect. 
Yeah, I mean, I, and, I, and I consider myself a very, a very visual writer. I mean, I see the story in my head. And I mean, that's even before I write a, an outline of a scene or a chapter, and I even call them scenes. When I'm working on a, a chapter, I see the chapter play through my head like a movie. And that, then I'll start to write it down. I mean, the difference between, uh, between visual and, and writing a book is that you can really infuse the prose with tone. And you know, in a screenplay will tend to be very flat because it's the director who who really puts the you know the the, the, the feeling onto the film and and you know the, and how the, you know the, the tone of the film. But when you're writing a book, you can really get into the minds of the characters. You can really just uh, just set the way that story feels and the moments that you have those you know that you want your readers to feel that chill up their spine and. The, you know, the, or the, the moment that you want to get to that place at the end of the chapter where they just can't stop, even though it's three in the morning, they have to flip that page. Mm -hmm. You know, that 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 type of stuff uh, is what I love about uh, being uh, writing prose. But then I love writing scripts as well. Uh, but the thing is, a script is just a blueprint for a movie or a TV show that might never get made. So it's uh, I tend to put my heart and soul more into the books because I know that those uh, are going to get out there and are going to reach an audience. And, and when it's done, it's done, you know, mm -hmm. with, and you have full control and mastery over what happens in between these pages. So you can really take the audience anywhere. Um, and, you know, when you're, writing a, when you're writing a screenplay or a film, you also have to think a lot about commercialism as well, I think a little more than you do when you have a book. Um, with screenplays, you have to, I mean, Netflix said that their, their biggest competition isn't Hulu, it's, it's sleep, you know. Um, <laughs> we, we, it's a highly competitive moment these days and every single time we write something we go okay is this more interesting than your TikTok right now um, maybe maybe not but let's try <laughs> you know mm -hmm. so that's that's exactly what we try to do and we're always trying to keep readers engaged um, because that's what we're up against another question Um, I'm just curious to know about how you came to be writing in the YA field, both of you. Well, for me, it actually started when I was a counselor at summer camp. When I was uh, between 18 and 23, when I was in college, every summer I would go to Kutcher's Camp Anawana in Monticello, New York, and I got to be known as the camp storyteller. And I would tell these stories, and the kids would always tell me, Neil, you got to write those into books. And so I started to do that. The first one, two didn't sell. The third one did. And uh, we actually have one of those campers in the audience with us today. <laughs> Jonas is, uh, is Jonas Schrader. First, he's a fine artist and has uh, done uh, some amazing paintings for an event that we're doing for Roxy tomorrow, uh, a charity event, which we'll, we'll tell you more about. But... Uh, you know, he was there when I first started coming up with these stories, and uh, and over the years, just you know, I, I would say that it all stems from being that storyteller and telling stories at camp and having people actually want to hear the stories. And when you're a storyteller at camp, you have power, because it's like I could go into any cabin on campus, and the other counselors they could not get the kids to calm down. The kids were throwing things, fighting one another. I walk into a cabin, they say, "It's Neil. We're gonna get a story." and they fall silent before me. So it's like I, I had this kind of cool power just being able to walk into a room and silence it just by my presence. Uh, and, but you know, I had to come up with good stories to tell to sort of keep them occupied and keep them interested. And so that's sort of when I started to really identify as a storyteller. Then I had a camp counselor storyteller for a father, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I just naturally went right into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, can I say something about yes. that experience? Uh, well, first of all, here's a flyer ah. for the show. For the show tomorrow. <laughs> this, this is the, the, one yeah, of the reasons why the we're in, uh, in, in D.C. is for this charity event for the Heron Project, which is an uh, addiction recovery uh, uh, charity. And uh, we're going to be doing an art show and, uh, and, and a, a book signing. And it's going to be a real fun event. So there's flyers, if any of you are interested, uh, please you know, take a flyer and we can see you tomorrow. I was just going to say, it's so funny that you um, brought up the um, comparison between you and like a, like essentially like a Jedi Knight because Neil <laughs> would walk into a room and he did have that power <laughs> because 
it was definitely the most interesting thing going on at camp. And none of us, you know, when you sign up for sleepaway camp, it's like, yeah, you're going to play basketball from 2 to 3, tennis from 4 to 6, swimming, you know, sailing. But, man, those, those campfire stories at, like, 9 o'clock at night when it's pitch black in, in, the, in, the, in the Catskills, those were, those were fantastic times. So I want to mm. thank you for that. And I'm not Great. surprised at all that this guy's sitting here with his son and they've <laughs> written over 50 unbelievable books. <laughs> thank you, John. Thanks, guys. Uh, there's time for a couple more questions before we sign books, if anybody has anything else that they would like to ask. Could you talk a little bit about how you write across genres, so dystopian versus more realistic versus kind of like the fantastical kind? Uh, for me, I hate the concept of genre. <laughs> if someone tells me I'm a science fiction author, the last ne next thing I want to do is write something that defies that. Uh, because you know, the thing about genre is that it's exclusionary. It's all about what you don't like. Oh, I don't read science fiction. Oh, I don't read romance. The second you say that, you've taken an entire class of literature and folded it up and put it in a box never to be looked at again. So what I try to do is I try to write stories that don't comfortably fit into a genre. That, you know, I mean, Challenger Deep, which is a story about the, the depths of the Marianas Trench, but it's also a fantasy, but it's also about mental illness. So where would you put that? You know, uh, it's, it's, it's something um, that we're always trying to do. Roxy, Ro what would you call Roxy? You know, it, it's kind of fantasy, but it's also realistic. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's gritty. So wh where does it fit, you know, in terms of genre? And I think being a genre buster is what has made the book successful because they offer something new. They don't just offer the tropes that you're familiar with. And yeah, there are many times that you, you want to read something familiar, but not all the time. Sometimes you want to be challenged. Sometimes you want to read something that is different from anything that you've read before, that you, that you, you know, didn't, didn't think about. I love it when people come up to me and say, you know, I never thought about that, this that way. I, you know, I n it never occurred to me. And so sort of coming up with those new ideas that never occurred to people and don't comfortably fit into a genre is kind of where I live. Great answer, so I'm going to pass. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, are there any more questions? Okay, so we can talk a little bit. Oh, you have to, yeah, please. <laughs> okay, so how do you keep track of all of your amazing plot twists? So specifically, I've read Scythe, just the first one, so no spoilers yet for the next two. Mm -hmm. But, um, Every time that there was a plot twist, I was so delightfully surprised, but I also could go back and be like, okay, I should have seen this coming. So how do you keep track of that, and how do you weave it in so well without spoiling it? That's the trick. The, the, <laughs> the trick is, is making sure that when something comes in that you weren't expecting, that it doesn't come in out of left field, that suddenly you realize, wait a second, the clues have been there all along. Sometimes I feel like I've layered in too many clues since I know that it's coming. So I, I leave it up to you know the editor to tell me whether or not I've oversold it or I've or I've you know or I haven't left enough clues. Uh, many times those twists are things that I didn't know were coming until they showed up, and that's one of the fun things about writing. You know, I know where the story is going, but I don't quite know how it's getting there. Uh, and so you say you've re you've you've read Scyther first one already? Okay, so I'll give you a perfect example of that. I had built the story and I kind of I knew, thought I knew where it was going. I always think I know where it's going, but it always changes. Uh, and everything was leading up to bringing the characters of Citra and Rowan, these two teenagers who are now apprentices to be a scythe. And the scythes are, uh, you know, if to be a scythe means that you have a license to kill. You, you, you travel the world ending life to thin out the population and it's legal and that is, that is the, it is their job. They are the Jedi of death, basically. And so these two kids are taken on as apprentices to, to do this. And finally, they're brought in front of the other sites at the big site meeting that they have three times a year to be introduced. And then suddenly the story stopped dead because everything was kind of leading up to their introduction. And then I didn't know what was going to happen. So I started to think about the, the antagonist of the story. It wouldn't sit well with the bad guy who's a, who's a bad site that these, that these two kids just get into, you know, get into these sites and get this apprenticeship uh, the way that they want it. And I thought from his point of view, he would throw something in there to really mess with them. And I thought, okay, if I was him, what would I do? 
and his name is Seth Goddard, and Seth Goddard decides he's going to propose that since there's two apprentices, when you're really only supposed to have one at a time, only one of them could become a scythe, and then when that one is chosen, that one has to kill the loser. I did not realize that was going to be an important part of the story until I got to that moment when I put myself in the point of view, in the, in the thought processes of the, uh, of the villain. And so suddenly the story took on a whole new twist and boom, it just shot forward and everything changed in the story at that point. And it was very exciting and you know, like you said, you didn't see it coming. I didn't see it coming until I got there. But then of course I had to go back and layer in everything leading up to it. So yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's fun for me when those things happen. Yeah, for me with plot twists, it's like, if I know that it's coming and I'm planning it, and you know, I, I usually will plan these things early, early on. So I was like, okay, this is where it's gonna go. I'm always kind of afraid that the readers are going to find out because it's like, to me, it's so obvious. So I just, so I give the book to my friends and like I, on page 135, what are you thinking? Who do you think is this? And I just test people. And I'll mm -hmm. give it to people that I know um, and just pick their brains. Yeah. Feedback makes a big difference. You ever read a book and while you're reading it, the characters haven't figured something out that you figured out 50 pages ago? I hate that. You know, I, I, I want the characters to be as, as smart as the readers. And yeah. so many times, uh, the this, this characters will not follow the plot because the plot sometimes means that they can't figure things out. If they figure things out too soon, they gotta change the plot to fit what the characters figure out and how smart they are. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dynamic process. Oh, we wanted to talk a little bit about the projects that we have coming up. Uh, for me, the next project that's coming out is called Gleanings, and it is a short story collection in the world of Scythe. And it is a, a lot of fun. There are a, a lot of really good stories. You know, people, fans have come up and asked about uh, different characters, wanting to see more of different characters, uh, wanting to see uh, backstories and like prequels. So there is a story that is Scythe Goddard when he was a teenager. You know, what made him who he was. There's a, there's a story about Scythe Curie. One of the things that, you know, she became famous for, for, for gleaning, which is, you know, taking the lives of the last president in his cabinet before the, when the Thunderhead took over. So we go back to that when she was only 17 and she made a name for herself by, by doing that. So that's, uh, that's in the collection. There's a story that Jared wrote with Sophie yeah, in the we, collection. Yeah, we wrote a short story about um, my wife. She's from Spain, so we wrote a story about that takes place in Barcelona about Saith Gaudi and Saith Dali. And what would it be like to Saith them, but in, in Europe or in Spain? And so, that, so the, the stories are a lot of fun. And, uh, and I, just finished, I just finished the last story in the collection on the flight here from Jacksonville. And I was sitting in the library here typing it in because I write longhand. I write in a notebook. So I was typing it in uh, right here in the library. So when you see, when you see that story, it's a, it's a story that's for the special edition that Barnes & Noble is doing. That uh, for their special edition, they wanted their own extra story. So I'm writing one extra story for them. And you'll know that part of it was written right here. And then uh, my book that's coming out, I wrote with Sophie, and it's called Retro. And it's essentially what would happen if there was like a really bad cyberbullying incident at a school, um, and a girl almost commits suicide. So imagine if TikTok, we, in our store, they're called Limbo, they come to the school and they say, okay, we're gonna fix this. We're gonna do a giant challenge called the Retro Challenge. Can you make it one year without using your phones or technology, and you'll get a full ride scholarship to wherever you want. And now everyone's like, um, okay, are we really gonna do this? But it, it turns out to be something really fun. I mean, kids are, people are like, their parents can't call them. They can't message them. They can do whatever they want. It was kind of sucks if it's just you, but if it's everyone, it's kind of fun. And everyone's wearing old clothes, driving old cars. There's a challenge every single week that they have to get through, whether it's a handcuff challenge for 24 hours or they're, you know, they have to find a place on a map in a, in a remote area, and how are you going to do that? Without so, Google Maps. <laughs> without GPS or anything like that. And so it's about this fun challenge. But then things start to kind of turn in a dark way because characters start disappearing. And it comes up to our main characters to realize who's behind this, why characters are disappearing, who's sabotaging the challenge, and what's the conspiracy at play. And that's called Retro. The next one's coming out next year. So that's uh, a little bit of what's in our future. Uh, thank you guys very much for coming. We've really enjoyed talking with you, and we will be here to sign books for you. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Go ahead.